Okay guys, just like last time, remember the chapters go really out of order, so make sure you follow along with me and follow along with the review questions that I have given you. Let's go ahead and dig back into chapter 9. Okay, so this story starts with how America is going to be changing. We've been talking a bit about westward expansion before, and we'll get back to it again soon, but for right now, we're talking about how the United States is changing from a, um, an, a, a, a agricultural society, sorry, and then moving forward to becoming a industrial society. So the first way that starts to happen is through a transportation revolution. During the War of 1812, our infrastructure in the United States is really weak. In fact, we pretty much quote unquote lost that war because our infrastructure was so weak. So there's going to need to be some internal improvements done in America to help keep, help keep things going. One of the first big ones that comes around is actually going to be the steamboat. Created by Robert Fulton, this allowed us to, do, uh, to increase travel by about, I don't know, a thousand percent when it comes to speed. Now we can have ships moving up and downstream, and it's going to basically make uh, transportation really easy. It's important to remember that it's significantly easier to transport materials, especially large and heavy materials, via water. Even today, most of our trade is done by water uh, because things can be so heavy that it's just easier to float something than it is to try to carry something or, heaven forbid, fly something that's really heavy. So, steamboats are going to be seen as really important. And it's actually going to lead to a vast network of canals and um, other ways of connecting rivers. That way we can have steamboats running across the United States. In fact, one of the most important of these canals is going to be the Erie Canal, which is going to basically open up the markets and population of New York to the Ohio Valley Territory. So this has a really big effect on, um, one, increasing population in Ohio, and two, um, lowering shipping prices and really helping unite the United States, east and west. So this opens up the frontier and reconnects the frontier to the major population centers. Plus, it allows those major population centers to industrialize, which we'll talk about later. Okay. Uh, as soon as we have steamboats uh, really taking off, as it were, we're going to have a major Supreme Court case. Now, again, the Supreme Court case is much more complicated than how I'm going to explain it. What really matters here is that there is an issue of interstate commerce. There is a monopoly given to two different guys, and one was given by the state and one was given by the U.S. government. The question becomes, who actually controls this monopoly? Who actually controls the waterways? And who actually regulates interstate commerce? Is it the states or is it the federal government? Well, as you and I both know, there's many instances in this class where we have to find ways that the federal government claims its supremacy. This is one of those ways. Gibbons v. Ogden, the United States government says that it and only it can regulate interstate commerce, not the states. And basically it's another way the U.S. government reasserts its authority. While canals and steamboats are really taking America by storm, the issue here, of course, is that you can't have a steamship going all over the United States, especially in places where there isn't water. The East Coast is basically covered in rivers, but the West and the frontier and parts of the South really don't have a lot of water. So we need to find a way to connect these places that we couldn't before. The way that we decide to do it is by using railroads. Now, railroads are great because they allow us to transport goods fast over land, and railroads can go places that canals and steamships can't. The problem here is that railroads are actually really expensive, and the federal government at first refuses to fund them, which means that these railroads are going to have to be privately funded. Privately funded means by individuals and individual businesses and companies are going to be funding these railroads, rather than having the federal government do it. What ends up happening here is that the gauges or the width of the railroads are going to be different based on the company building it. So there's going to be a whole bunch of questions of who can use these lines. If you have um, a train built with the wrong gauge, it can't, can't use these lines. Goods can be destroyed, etc., etc. What really matters here is to make sure that you understand that railroads are going to drastically change the United States. It's going to help connect the United States. It's going to help industrialize the United States, and they are privately funded. These are not funded by the federal government yet.
so then why does the United States industrialize? I just said that the railroads are going to help us industrialize. Well, why? Well, I mean, how? How do we do this? Well, the Industrial Revolution in the United States is just like the one in Europe. Um, because less people are needing to farm now because of technology, new products and services are going to exist. And now, as soon as one of those exists, more and more and more and more keep happening. It's kind of like a snowball effect. So the same thing happens in the United States. We lag behind Europe, but eventually we're going to leapfrog over them. So why do we industrialize? Well, the first one is that the Embargo Act of 1807. The Embargo Act of 1807 basically implied that we were not going to trade with Europe. Well, the problem is Europe has always made finished goods. They were always ahead of us in that case. That's where the United States comes from. Well, not the United States. The American colonies comes from. They were used as a place of raw materials. That way Europe could finish those goods. That's why they colonized this area. So now that we, in the embargo of 1807, now that we're not going to trade with them, we have to make our own products. Number two, a second major reason why actually has to do with the environment. So uh, as you guys remember, probably from world history, factories needed to be near rivers. Well, we have rivers every 10 feet in the United States, so we have plenty of places to build these factories. That ends up helping us out. In fact, most of our early cities are going to be um, next to rivers. In fact, that's the East Coast is covered in rivers. That's where all the cities are. Having just driven through it, I can tell you that if there isn't a river, there isn't a major city on the East Coast. They're the very opposite of us here on the West. Excellent. Number three, we have a technological advantage. And what I mean by that is not that we have superior technology. It's more a matter of we can see something built in Europe, see how that works, and then come back and be like, okay, we saw how that worked. Let's build the exact same thing or maybe something slightly better because we can see a newer technology. Maybe things have changed. So we can basically copy Europe because we lagged a little bit behind them. Number four has to do with tariffs. So the United States imposed tariffs on Europe in order to keep prices equal. Well, Europe did the same thing on us. So it, because we don't want to pay those tariffs, we're going to have to be able to make that stuff here, hence industrialization. Number five, as more products are created, more people are gonna buy those products. It's kind of a cycle. So as more products are created, we're able to actually make those products cheaper. And because we can make them cheaper, more people are gonna want to buy them, which means that companies are gonna wanna make more stuff, which means it's gonna be cheaper, which means it's gonna encourage more people to buy it. It is a consistent cycle. It's basically the economic cycle that it ends up creating. And then finally, number six, there's little government intervention. The government doesn't get in the way of businesses, really, for the next hundred years, the government doesn't get in the way of businesses. And this is gonna have good and bad consequences, and we'll be talking about that in the next couple of weeks. So don't worry too much about it right now, but we'll talk about what the effect of the United States government not being involved in business, we'll talk about what those effects are. But those are the main reasons why we industrialize. Hey, I skipped this during the class lecture, so if you're watching this, maybe you're going to get to learn something new. Um, here are some early inventions that your textbook talks about. They're not too complicated. Eli Whitney creates the cotton gin. You can see that here on the bottom right. What that did is that separated the seeds in cotton from the actual cotton itself. The cotton seeds are actually really sharp, and of course they can't be used in clothing because they'd hurt really bad. So this machine was designed to separate the cotton from the seeds. Ironically, this is designed and created to actually reduce the need for slaves, but what this ended up doing was making cotton cheaper, which means more people wanted it, which means that slavery increased. It had the exact opposite effect of its original intention. Uh, John Deere creates something called the steel-tipped plow, and you better believe that it was painted green and yellow. Um, Basically what this did is it, uh, the steel tip plow allowed farmers to break up land that they normally couldn't have done with inferior equipment. So we are actually able to farm in land that we normally couldn't, which is gonna open up specifically territory out west. Excellent. Uh, Cyrus McCormick, he is going to make something called the mechanical reaper. You can see it here on the left. It makes it easier to harvest grain. That's where that comes from. All of these inventions are going to increase 
either plantations or farming, and these are going to have a big effect on life out west. Okay, let's keep this party rolling, and we're going to dive into chapter 11 now. Now, your textbook calls this the era of rising prosperity. The logic here being that because people are working in factories now and not working on a farm, they're making more money. But there's a downside of this prosperity because Americans are going to have to buy pretty much every product they need. Whereas when you lived on a farm, you always had food. You pretty much always had shelter on a farm. You always had that to count on. But now with um, people living in cities and working in factories, they're actually going to lose that security. And it does have a drastic effect on America. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, you can see here on the bottom right, you can see a typical house that a worker would have in a factory. Pretty small, pretty cramped, pretty dingy, and pretty dirty. This is probably between four and six people live in this house. Um, hopefully a mother and father and a couple of children, or it could be four or five or six guys all living in a house um, until they can find a way to get married. But that's going to be difficult because you're going to be working 12 to 16 hour days six sometimes seven days a week so there is definitely a price to pay for this prosperity those houses by the way are what we're going to call tenements uh, here in the bottom right I think we counted what seven people in this picture total um, living in a pretty small room this is a tenement house it is a small um, not really sanitary area that uh, typically poor immigrants are going to live in. We'll talk about immigrants in a second, but these are tenements exist in cities and this is where people are going to live. Now this is, it's hard to call this a quality of life improvement. I mean, yeah, we have internal heating, but we don't actually have chimneys or anything. So yes, while we have a stove that could heat up a house, all that smoke stays inside the room and suffocates and kills people. So it's tough, tough to call this a quality improvement. Um, at the same time, we're also going to have, uh, when trash is thrown away, they just throw it out in the street. Uh, when, when people go to the bathroom, they go in a bucket and then dump that excrement in the street. We're going to have a lot of animals in the street as well. That way they can clean, and, uh, clean up and eat all of the trash that's thrown out. I, I wouldn't really call this a great new advancement in the quality of life that people are leading. Let's talk about diseases and health. You don't want to go back in time to the 1800s because going to a doctor was a death sentence. Doctors are, well, I don't want to say they're not trained because that's, that's, that's an unfortunate wording. It's more of a matter of they didn't really understand medical science the way we understand it now. Doctors have this habit of not washing their hands. If you were sick, they had this habit of just bleeding out your bad blood, attaching leeches to you or slitting your wrist and bleeding out your bad blood. If it was really if you had a cold, they figured that something was wrong with your blood, so they would just put you in a, or they have you open all the doors and windows of your house and just let all that cold air clean you up. Um, it's not a very healthy time to go back in time. So if you have the option, avoid the 1800s because it's not very healthy. Let's talk about entertainment. Now, entertainment takes a couple of avenues here. Because the, American, uh, the average American now is going to be working in a factory versus on a farm, well, yeah, you're working 12, 16-hour days, six days a week, but you do have that Sunday off. You have to find a way to entertain, entertain yourself, and there are a couple of ways that we do that. The very first way, well, not the very first way, but a way that your textbook's going to talk about is about this guy named P.T. Barnum. You've probably heard of him from Barnum & Bailey's Circus. Now, his idea was to have basically a traveling entertainment slash freak show with a bunch of strange exhibits that would entertain Americans. His famous line was, there's a sucker born every minute, because he often pulled tricks on people in order to convince them to enjoy his, his uh, freak show. He pulled a lot of stunts. He painted things weird and said it was, you know, from someplace in Africa, but it could have just been some trash he picked up. But Americans loved this idea. Some other forms of entertainment include newspapers. We're actually going to have an increase in newspapers during this time period, mainly because newspapers are going to become easier to print. We already have a pretty literate society in this country, as opposed to uh, Europe. We're much more literate than Europe is, because that's been part of the religious prerogative of this country. But now, with the invention of the penny press, that we, we can make newspapers for cheaper, 
which is going to encourage more and more people to read the news. It's also going to require the news itself to actually exist as we know it. The requirement here is that the requirement here is that because newspapers are going to come out every day, they have to have something to talk about every single day. So we're going to have people working at newspapers, going to events, and checking in on the government, and doing things that would we would constitute as news. That way it could justify its existence every single day. That is the consequence of having more and more newspapers. So if you don't like the news and don't like all that stuff, well, you have the penny press to blame. Sorry. Another way that Americans entertained themselves was via literature, but as we know, this bores me to death, and it's pretty much the majority of what you'll discuss in AP English, so I will save this for AP English. Your textbook does talk about these authors, it does talk about this idea of romanticism and transcendentalism, but it's, it's outside the scope of this class as a means of deeper study. Just know that these are some authors, these are the books that they wrote, and then look up what transcendentalism slash romanticism actually means. Once you have that, you'll be just fine. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not the most important, drastically complicated thing in the world. Um, but it's just something that I think that you guys should be able to look up on your own. Okay, let's keep going. So now we're on to chapter 13. Now that we have industrialized, the good thing about industrialization is that there are a lot of jobs available. There's never a shortage of jobs during an industrial economy, especially when you just start industrializing. There's a multitude of jobs. And the United States also has another interesting conundrum. We have a multitude of land, which is going to attract a bunch of immigrants. And that's actually exactly where my story is going right now. We're going to have a lot of immigrants coming to the United States, specifically immigrants from Germany and Ireland. Now, these new immigrants that are coming into the United States while still from Europe, are slightly different. They're not necessarily coming here to become Americans. They're coming here for a better life. They're coming here to have the opportunity for land, have the opportunity for, um, for wealth that they're not going to get in Europe. But the problem that is that they're not necessarily trying to become Americans. This is where we start to see uh, developments of places like Little Italy, um, on the West Coast, we have Little Tokyo, and the reason why that exists is that these immigrant groups come to the United States, but then they don't actually try to assimilate or even acculturate to be more like Americans. They decide they want to be very, well, themselves, which isn't necessarily wrong and isn't necessarily a bad thing, but for our intents and purposes, they're not trying to become American, which is going to lead to some resentment, which of course is my next slide. The response of the average white native-born citizen of the United States is to respond with hatred towards these immigrant groups. Now, this is still a common thing in the United States today. We are a nation of immigrants. However, we don't really like immigrants. Now, in, now in the United States, we have a problem with immigrants from Latin America, specifically here in California. You hear about that a lot. But if you go back in time, there's pretty much always been an issue with immigrants in this country. That's just pretty much how this country works, unfortunately. The Germans and the Irish during this time period are going to be treated and responded to with a series of nativism. Nativism basically says that you should never hire an immigrant. You should always hire a native-born American, a native citizen. Now, that does not mean a Native American Indian, of course. This means a white citizen that was... Um, born here already and is already part of the American ideal, as it were. So the response of having immigrants come to this country is going to be nativism. So let's put, two th let's put a couple things together here. We have an increase in technology, which is going to lead to industrialization, which is going to lead to a necessity of jobs. There are immigrants that come to the United States searching for jobs and searching for a better life, but the response of Americans once they get here is, we don't like you because you don't want to be an American. You want to be an Irish guy living in America, taking the opportunities that Americans would typically have and take it away from them and try to make your own life. Had these immigrants have tried to acculturate or assimilate more, the response probably wouldn't have been as negative. But because they don't, this is the response we have. 
Okay. If you haven't already and you've been listening the whole way through, please take a break because we're going to shift mental gears here. We've been talking about industrialization and everything else, and now we're going to paint a different picture. So I want you guys to just go ahead and just take a second, go get some ice cream, take a break, go for a little walk. As we've discussed, go take your dog for a walk. He's probably looking at you like he wants to go for a walk. It's good for them. Take a break because now we're going to shift mental gears and talk about westward expansion again. Specifically, we're going to be talking about Texas. Okay, so as you guys know, Mexico was controlled by Spain. In 1821, Mexico gains their independence from Spain. And Mexico is going to realize that they need to do things a little bit differently than Spain did if they want to have a successful country. They're already going to be slightly more successful than Spain was, mainly because they're going to have some more localized power in a localized government, but they're going to need more if they're going to actually sustain themselves, especially with the Americans slowly but surely pushing west. Mexico needs to build itself up. So here's what they do. Knowing that Spain's one of Spain's biggest problems was the fact that they had a difficult time colonizing this region, what they're going to do is they're going to basically encourage people to move into what we now call the American Southwest specifically Texas. So Mexico was going to offer land, basically free land, to Americans that want to live in Texas. So they are still American citizens, but they're going to live in Texas, get free land, and be able to stay there. We call these peoples empresarios. And the first major empresario is, is going to be this guy named Stephen Austin. Now, Impresarios start moving out there. They start building their farms and their plantations, by the way, because most impresarios were from the South, which means that they are slave owners. This is all fine and good, except for the fact that in 1829, Mexico outlaws slavery and does not want the impresarios to have slaves. Now, as you guys know, the uh, slaves are really important to the Southern economy and Southern society, so they're not going to be so willing to give up their slaves. Well, what ends up happening here is that there's gonna this eventually leads to a revolution. Now again, I am glossing over many, many important details, and I'm sure if someone from Texas is viewing this, they're gonna say, you got this wrong, you Californian. But for our intents and purposes, let's just keep moving here. Texas is gonna go through a revolution in 1836. These empresarios, uh, led by Stephen Austin and Sam Houston, are going to say that they should have their independence from Mexico. Ostensibly, they want their independence, that way they can keep their slaves. They go through a revolution, and um, there's going to be a couple of battles. On the one side, we're going to have Sam Houston, who's going to lead the impresarios and lead, I don't want to say the Americans because they're not, <clears throat> going to lead the Texans against Mexico. And on the other side, for the Mexico side, we have Santa Ana. Let's check out this actual fight. Now, if you were to look at the numbers, you would realize that, well, Mexico has got Texas outnumbered. They really do. The first battle we're going to talk about is the Battle of the Alamo, which, of course, is famous for the fact that the Texans lose badly. Over 200, there's only 200 Texas soldiers at this battle and 4,000 Mexican soldiers, so you can guess how things went. Um, it's such a horrible defeat and such a massive defeat for the Texans that their rallying cry in future battles is to remember the Alamo. Remember this battle we really sucked at? Let's, let's keep remembering it. A um, couple months later, we're going to have the Battle of San Jacinto, which is going to be a victory for the Texans. And Texas has now been able to declare their independence. Now, this is interesting. This means that Texas is no longer part of Mexico. But it's also not part of the United States yet. It's its own independent country during this time period. Meanwhile, in the United States, we're going to have the rise of the Whig Party. Now remember, since 1828, we've had Jacksonian Democrats in power. Jacksonian Democrats are people that do not want an expansion of the government. And that's the size of the government, by the way. They don't want an expansion of the size of government. They don't want internal improvements. Um, they are, they are, Jacksonians, I should say, are big on slavery and states' rights. So, in 1840, with the election of William Henry Harrison, 
the American public is expecting a different person leading the country. They are expecting the Whigs. The Whigs are going to be anti-slavery, they're going to lead to internal improvements, and they're going to want a bigger government. That's what everyone expects. But William Henry Harrison doesn't, you know, live for very long. And as he dies, his vice president, John Tyler, takes over. Now, again, we talked about this issue of balancing the ticket, which means that people are going to vote for Harrison because he's Harrison. And, but that's not going to be enough. He has to try to steal some voters from the Democratic Party. So he's going to pick a guy to run with him that really might be a little bit more of a Democrat than a Whig. He picks this guy named John Tyler, who is a slave owner from the South, to be part of his anti-slave campaign. Which, again, this would have been fine. It's what leads to Harrison's victory. This would have been fine so long as nobody dies. William Henry Harrison dies, and then John Tyler takes over. John Tyler does not act like a Whig when he is president. In fact, he acts like the exact opposite. He ends up taking away and cutting down many of the things that the American public thought was going to happen during this administration. Tyler is not going to be a very popular guy, and maybe he shouldn't be, because he did the exact opposite of what everybody expected. Which brings us to Texas. Tyler is not a good president. He doesn't do anything that he said he would do. He doesn't do anything that a Whig would do. Except, Tyler is actually, ironically, very good at foreign policy, and he's going to see that the American public wants to bring Texas in. So, for our discussion right now, we will say that um, the American public wants us to bring Texas in, and Tyler is going to be the guy to do it. But it wasn't really Tyler's idea to bring in Texas. The real reason why Texas is admitted into the country is because of the election of 1844. Let's talk about our competitors in this election. On one side, we have Henry Clay, who is a Whig. Again, the American public wants a Whig in office because Whigs are going to be the ones that are going to lead to internal improvements, which this country desperately needs to be successful. However, Henry Clay can't make up his mind about Texas. He can't decide if Texas should come in or not. Now, the American public is really, really just foaming at the mouth and desperate for more land. But, unfortunately, Henry Clay is not going to give them that land because Henry Clay does not want Texas to come in. Now, on the other hand, we have this guy named James K. Polk. James K. Polk is a Democrat, but he doesn't really act much like a Democrat. He's a Democrat, but his belief is that let's bring in all the territory we can, regardless of the consequences over the issue of slavery, let's bring in all of the territory we can. So that's exactly what he, d he says he's going to do. The American public votes him in in a relative landslide, but don't worry, Henry Clay doesn't disappear forever. They vote him in in a relative landslide, and James K. Polk is going to be our president. Well, because of this... Because of this, Texas is going to be added to the Union. Now, technically, the reason why Texas is added is because James K. Polk said he wanted it added. But what ends up really happening is that the election is so one-sided and the American public is so desperately wanting a, to bring Texas in that John Tyler goes, well, I guess I'll do it, and he's going to be the one that brings Texas in. But there's a little bit more to the story. I'll get to it later. Now, at the same time all this is going on, the American public goes through something that we call manifest destiny. Manifest destiny implies that it is the American's God-given right to move westward. And really, that's not even the right way to say this. It's more of a matter of God wants Americans to control the entire American continent, and they should move westward. This picture perfectly describes it. And what I really want you guys to do is I want you to pause this video and blow this up full screen and look at this image and see what this image is showing you. I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, welcome back. So hopefully you got the fact that in the center here we have potentially Lady Liberty moving west. In one hand she has a Bible, in the other hand she has a telegraph wire. You can see a developed city out on the right, but out on the left you don't really see much. You don't see much development. In fact, it's dark. And as the Americans are moving westward, they are bringing light to this area. You can see some Native Americans in the bottom left, but you can see that they are in darkness too. And Lady Liberty is going to enlighten them, enlighten them as they go. 
You can see uh, trains also moving westward. You can see canals in the far right as well. This picture pretty much perfectly describes what Manifest Destiny is. The Americans are going to use this continent properly. They're going to bring it into the lightness, and it is God's will that this happens. Americans want to control as much land as possible. In fact, take a look at this map. This map pretty much is what James K. Polk envisioned the United States being by the time he left office. And you know what? With the exception of Mexico and Cuba, this is what the United States looks like when James K. Polk leaves office. And this is what Americans wanted. They wanted to control the entire continent. Every square foot of land mattered to the American public. Now, the biggest knock we can have on Polk is the fact that he's not going to be concerned about slavery expanding westward. That he's not going to be worried about that at all. He'd rather get the land in. But the rest of America kind of concerned about slavery moving westward. But again, that's going to be a story for another day. This is what Polk wants the American map to look like when he's done being president. And to be honest, I'll tell you guys how it happens over the next couple of slides. This is pretty much what America looks like, minus Cuba and what we now recognize as Mexico. Let's keep the story rolling here. Okay, so the first fight is going to be over the Oregon Territory. Well, and I really shouldn't even call it a fight because it's actually not. What ends up happening here is that we have to make a connection back to something a couple chapters ago. John Quincy Adams, when he was Secretary of State under James Monroe, signed something called the adams onis Treaty of 1819. It basically said that the United States and Great Britain are going to basically leave the, o the Oregon Territory open to whoever can settle it first. If the United States settles it first, they get it. If Oregon, or sorry, if Canada slash Great Britain settles it first, they get it. Well, what ends up happening is that it's been about 25 years and no one has settled it because Oregon is in the middle of nowhere and it's really hard to get to. So, when Polk becomes president, he pretty much says, hey, look, I want this land. I want this land now. Um, the Canadians slash Great Britons are reluctant to give us this land. Basically... Um, Polk goes fine if you're not going to if you're not going to give it to me I'm going to take it and I'm going to take it all the way up to the 5440 line which is basically most of what is now British Columbia however as we know the British Columbians are not part of the United States that is not our 51st state so something must have happened to settle the border at the previously established 49th parallel what is going to distract James K. Polk from taking more land and taking Canada. That way we'd have an endless supply of trees and ice and potentially maple syrup and beavers. What possibly could have distracted James K. Polk from getting this? Pretty simple. It's going to be a little war with Mexico. Speaking of war with Mexico, before I get that party started, go ahead and take a look at this picture of all the flags. I think this is pretty cool. I personally would want to bring back in the, uh, the star design for our flag. Because one, it'd be impossible for students to draw, and two, it just looks nifty. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the stars and stripes. I am as patriotic as anyone else. But, come on, stars, star, stars and stripes should really be like a star and stripe. It's like stars and stars of stripes. Or, you know, if you want to use an internet meme, hey man, I, found, I knew you guys like stars in your flag, so I put stars inside of your stars. Okay, it doesn't work. Either way, let's talk about a little war with Mexico, which, by the way, might be America's most successful war, which is saying something because some of our early wars are pretty successful. Um, this is our first clear cut, pretty hardcore victory when it comes to a war. But that being said, it wasn't like Mexico was fully prepared. Let's discuss. OK, so I had told you previously that um, John Tyler is going to say, hey, Texas, why don't you come in the Union? Well, there's one little problem here. Mexico's not so happy with how this goes down. Let's tell the story. When we tell Texas that we want to bring Texas into the United States, there's, there's a problem. Texas is afraid that a war is going to break out if they come into the United States, and perhaps justifiably so, because they have Mexico right on their border, and... Mexico is not too happy with how things went down. So 
we have to basically encourage Texas and, you know, sweeten the deal for them to come into the United States. How do we do it? Well, we tell Texas that we want to annex them. You annex a country when you bring in, uh, sorry, you annex a country when you bring them into another one. So us bringing in Texas is an example of annexing. It's not just acquiring territory because Texas is an independent country already. I know it's, it's semantics, but that's, that's just words for you. We tell Texas that we think their border should be all the way to the Rio Grande. Now, you could see on this map that the actual border that the Mexican government considers with Texas is that red line. That's where they think the real border is. But the United States says, hey, we'll extend it and make Texas even bigger. We are going to double the size of Texas if Texas comes in. And to sweeten the deal, just in case Mexico doesn't like this, we are going to send our military under the command of Zachary Taylor into this disputed territory to protect Mexico. Now again, as we've said before, let's step back and think about this. The United States is going to basically take land away from Mexico and then say, and then put a military general there and tell Mexico to do something about it. Mexico only has one logical conclusion here. They're going to have to fight us over the fact that we are just taking territory from them. Mexico declares war on the United States. The United States responds in turn. And now we have the Mexican-American War, which is perhaps the most successful war in American history, with one minor exception we'll talk about later. Now, the war itself, uh, the battles don't really matter. It doesn't. But what ends up happening here is that the United States is going to win this war pretty easily. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to diminish the fact that, you know, several thousand soldiers die on both sides. But really, this is a pretty easy war for the United States. They win pretty easily in Texas. They win pretty easily in California. We even send a bunch of troops into Mexico City and we capture Mexico City. The entire country has essentially fallen to the United States. So we've, we've, we've done pretty well. you got to give us credit here. The United States has done pretty well. However, there's going to be some interesting concessions as this war ends. Let's talk about the treaty that ends this war. Now, the United States has conquered pretty much all of Mexico, and James K. Polk, among others, actually wanted to take the entire country of Mexico, including Baja, California, all of Mexico as we know it, and the Yucatan Peninsula. Well, the problem was there were too many people in that region already, and Congress was reluctant to bring in a country full of so many people that spoke a different language, that had so much debt as a nation, Congress didn't want to bring all of that in. So instead, Congress makes a deal with Mexico that we get a bunch of land in what is now going to be known as the American Southwest. We're going to take land in what we now call California, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, as opposed to taking land near Mexico City, which we technically had the right to because we beat them in war. We're going to pay Mexico $15 million in order to get this land, and Mexico is going to give it to us. They're not going to be happy about it, but they're going to give it to us. And, well, at this point, the map as we know it is the exact map that James K. Polk wanted. We have the Ohio Valley Territory now, now brought into the United States. We have the American Southwest brought into the United States. The Louisiana Purchase is being settled. The Dakota Territories are being settled. The Kansas-Nebraska Territories are being settled. Exactly what was promised by James K. Polk is exactly what has been delivered. Okay, between you and me, the last four slides are probably not going to show up on the AP exam. Sorry to waste your time. But here's what will show up on the AP exam. Now, before I tell you what this is, I want you guys to write down and remember that this does not actually get added to the treaty. A proviso or proviso, depending on who you ask, is an addendum or a bylaw that's added to a treaty. So, this would have, would have been added to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had it have been passed, but it's not going to be passed. Here's what it is. The Wilmot Proviso would have banned slavery in pretty much any territory. Had this have passed, slavery would not have extended into the Mexican Cession. It would not have extended into the Ohio Valley Territory. 
Heck, it wouldn't have extended into the Kansas-Nebraska territory, which might ring an alarm bell in your head if you remember anything from 8th grade, but we all know that you don't. Um, this proviso would have essentially guaranteed that slavery would not have extended. Had slavery not have extended, maybe we wouldn't have had a civil war. That's how important this idea is. So again, the Wilmot Proviso would have not allowed slavery to extend westward. But, as you guys know, the Wilmot Proviso is not added to the treaty, and slavery does extend westward, leading to, you know, this thing called the Civil War. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the election of 1848. James K. Polk, despite having perhaps the most successful one-term presidency in our nation's short history up to this point, decides he doesn't want to run anymore. So, a new guy named Lewis Cass, who, I, I, he looks like someone. It's been bugging me ever since we first discussed it. I can't figure out who it is, but he looks like somebody evil. I, 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 I don't know who it is. It's like an actor in a movie, and if I could figure it out, it would make my life so much happier. But I can't, so we'll move on. Um, Lewis Cass, you don't have to know about him because he doesn't become president, so he, we don't care. Um, Martin Van Buren, he's been president before. He's coming back with better mutton chops. And he's going to run for a new political party called the Free Soil Party. Their biggest concern, it wasn't their only concern, but their biggest concern is about not having slavery. That's pretty much all you really have to know about them. They're not big about the extension of slavery. Finally, we have Zachary Taylor, who's going to win because he's not these other two guys. Um, he's going to be a Whig, and he's going to win because he's not Martin Van Buren, and he was, by the way, blamed for the Panic of 1837, and he's not Lewis Cass. So, right now, everything is ideal in the United States. We have a bunch of land, people are moving westward, there's money being made by industrialization. The 1840s are a good time in U.S. history, but everyone knows that this issue about slavery is going to need to be settled. Something's going to happen in regards to this issue of slavery, and... Well, it's just a matter of when. When is the United States going to have to deal with this? Now, the logic was, maybe it's not going to show up because the land that we've acquired is not really suitable for slavery, so maybe slavery won't extend westward. You know, the American Southwest is a big, giant, barren wasteland, and you can't grow cotton there, so maybe slavery is not going to extend. However, everything would be okay so long as there isn't something that's going to exacerbate or accelerate the amount of people moving west so long as nothing's going to happen that could keep that could tilt the tenuous balance in congress nothing's going to come in to square everything up so long as nothing happens we'll be okay unfortunately for the united states there's gold in our heels we find gold in california and this is going to accelerate all of the issues we have in the united states gold remember is going to be seen as super important because we're not dealing in paper money during this time period we are dealing in specie so if you can have gold you pretty much have guaranteed wealth in fact from the way the stories were being told you could you know dip your head into the american river and pop out looking like c-3po um you know everyone that was coming to california is going to be a gold digger that's that's what you did well a gold panner at least you're going to be digging for gold um and many of the immigrants in America are going to start pushing towards California. Many of the people that are not happy with their lives are going to be pushing westward to California. And soon, California has enough money and enough people to become a state. California wants to extend north and south of the Mason-Dixon line, which is going to mess with the Missouri Compromise. But it has a lot of money almost immediately, and it has a lot of people almost immediately. California is going to have to be addressed. And in fact, it's California's entering the Union that really accelerates this country towards a civil war. Unfortunately for you guys, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to hear how that story goes. Because before I can tell it, we need to talk about this whole issue of slavery to begin with. Before we can really talk about the Civil War, though, we have to talk about what the South actually looks like. And... I'm going to go ahead and maybe tell you the South is not exactly what you think. It actually looks a lot different than you may, you may assume. Not as many people own slaves in the South as you might expect. 
And that's going to be our discussion for today. Well, well, whenever you're watching this. So let's start talking about antebellum Southern society. Now, the South is a completely different place than the North. It's important to remember this idea I've been bringing up many times about sectionalism. The North and the South in the United States are two completely different places. The North is a industrialized, urbanized economy um, that makes stuff. The South is a plantation slave-owning society that makes cash crops and very little actual food. That's, what, that's how the economies are based. But there's going to be some consequences of this. Because we have a slave-based economy in the South, there isn't as much competition or drive for success, which means that the South is going to have a limited education, because why bother educating yourself if you're going to pretty much always have free labor to earn you money? Um, but the South is also, also going to be extremely wealthy, because of slavery. So it's, it's going to be an interesting dichotomy where you have a bunch of really super educated or uh, super wealthy people that aren't really all that educated. Um, but all of their success is predicated on slavery existing, which is going to be a problem specifically for the North. Anyway, um, that is what the South is doing. They are now transitioning from growing tobacco to growing more uh, cotton because that is going to be proving more successful and actually more financially viable for the South. Um, they're still growing co uh, tobacco as well, but cotton becomes the new major industry. Um, turns out everyone loves American cotton. Let's discuss cotton in more detail. Cotton is going to be a major product in the South because it is so dang profitable. It costs almost nothing to plant. It is profitable on any scale. One guy that doesn't own slaves can make a profit selling, selling cotton, as can a large plantation with a hundred slaves can make a profit on cotton. It requires a certain climate that the American South is quote unquote blessed to have. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's what they have. I mean, it's, it's the climate they have. That climate is going to be beneficial for the South for growing cotton. It's profitable on any scale. In fact, 75% of the world's cotton is going to come from the American South. The problem though is that, and this is gonna be a little bit of a spoiler alert, cotton is actually very draining to the soil. Um, cotton tends to kill the soil after so many plantings. So it's not, it's not good um, for the soil in that regard, which means that for a cotton farmer to be successful, they have to have a bigger and bigger tract of land, and they have to keep moving further and further west to keep planting. I think you can see where I'm going with this. This is going to be an issue um, in the American South. Again, it's not good for the soil. Um, and by the way, uh, I hate saying stuff like this because it always sounds so, so wrong, and now that I'm recording it, it'll be saved for posterity. Um, Slavery obviously is really, really bad. However, not most slave masters weren't actually particularly violent towards their slaves because you have to remember that is where they are getting their wealth and money from. Don't get me wrong. Of course, discipline happened. And of course, it was a horrible, horrible tragedy. And I'm not trying to diminish what happened in the slave South. However, from a logical standpoint, we have to remember that keeping slaves alive was to the benefit of the slave owners because then those slaves could work for them so yes there is untold millions upon millions of horrible atrocities and stories that happen to slaves but at the same time there is a benefit to slave owners to keeping slaves alive to keep the system going it is during this time period that the American North and the American South start to diverge. I'm sorry, that picture on the bottom left, mixed with the picture on the bottom or top right, just always makes me laugh. And again, my family is from the Deep South. Um, even though I don't have any record in my family of my family ever owning slaves, they are from the Deep South, and uh, I would be lying to you if I said that I hadn't seen one of these in person. Anyway. Um, <laughs> It's more fun than it looks, I promise you. Anyway, um, the North and the South are going to be two completely different places. As we've already discussed before, but it, it bears repeating, the North is industrialized, the South is not. In fact, the South is not really concerned about um, education. They're not really concerned about 
industrialization. They have a third of the country's population, yet they only have 10% of the country's factories. And those factories are, are only making products that help expand slavery. So again, they're going to be two different places. The North is going to have a educated and moral argument against slavery, and the South is going to need it to exist. However, not as many people in the South own slaves as you might expect. Let's discuss. Three-fourths of white Southerners owned no slaves. 75% of people in the South owned no slaves. And of the 25% that do own slaves, most only own 10 slaves or less. This idea of a large plantation having hundreds of slaves on it is really, really infrequent in the American South. In fact, not very many people own slaves in the South at all. I know, I know, and it makes it interesting. Why on earth do these people fight for the, to be able to keep slavery? It, there must be more to the Civil War than just slavery. Anyway, the first group is going to be the plantation group or the planters. These are going to be the people that do that very small percent of the American South that actually do own a lot of slaves and do own, um, you know, the large plantations. Again, this is this is going to be a very small percentage of the American South, but this is the part of the American South that most people think of when they think of slave owners. Uh, we're talking large plantations. We're thinking, you know, Gone with the Wind style, where um, people are very extremely wealthy. They have uh, slaves working in and outside of the house, but they have almost nothing to do with the actual process of what happens. Excuse me, on the plantation. This is the planter class. Most slave owners, as we know them, are going to be small farmers. These are going to be families that own less than 20 slaves, and this makes up the majority of the slave-owning class. Small farmers, of course, just like a small business, wants to become a larger scale operation, but they don't for various reasons. Or, I mean, they're always trying. So these are going to be the people that are actually pushing to keep slavery in existence, less so than the planter class, because the planter class has already made their money. This group is trying to make their money. But most American people in the South are actually going to be what we call yeoman farmers. These are farmers that do not own any slaves whatsoever. Now, don't get me wrong, they're not opposed to slavery. In fact, many of them still benefit from the system. But this is going to be a majority of the American South. Now, granted, that is probably a picture of Abe Lincoln there on the left, but that's pretty much what a yeoman farmer looked like. So, anyway. Um, <laughs> Yemen farmers are going to be a majority of the South. Now, the very bottom, bar bottom of the barrel in the South are going to be these squatters. They don't work. These are the rednecks as we know and love them today. These are going to be the people that are at the very bottom of Southern society. But, and this is actually kind of where the whole concept of slavery comes from, these people are at the bottom of Southern society, but... No matter how poor, inbred, dumb, and stupid these people are, they're still going to be socially above blacks. And that's going to be a big reason why slavery, for a social consideration, needs to remain in existence in the American South. At least, according to them. You ever wonder if it's possible for a Southerner to defend slavery against the existence of life in the North? Now that came out wrong. The, ex the way of life in the North. Well, somebody did. His name is George Fitzhugh. George Fitzhugh wrote a, uh, an article that was called In Defense of Southern Slavery. And the logic behind it was that, really, if you think about it, what is going on in the South is actually much better than what's going on in the North. The white Northerners are basically wage slaves, and they are um, forced to work in factories. They are slaves to the clock. They are slaves to paychecks. Um, and they have to fight and live in horrible conditions for everything they have and without any real chance of advancement or anything. Really, they're not living a good life. However, in the American South, yes, they are using slavery, but unlike a factory where you can be replaced by someone else and the, your employer doesn't care about you, in the American South, there is a huge investment put into slavery. So slaves have 
or I should say plantation owners, have a vested interest in keeping slaves alive and, um, and making sure that they are healthy and making sure that they are prosperous and clothed and fed. Um, in the American factory, you work a 12 to 16 hour day, but on an American plantation in the South, well, sun goes down, you're, you, you, know, you have the night free. I'm not saying it's a perfect defense, but this is a defense that uh, is going to be really popular in the American South. At the same time, the church is also going to promote the idea of slavery, saying that slavery allows whites a means of education for, um, for slaves. So the fact that slavery exists means that whites can show their cultural and religious superiority to them and also bring slaves closer to God. I'm going to give a brief discussion of what the life of an American slave was like, and I'll try to bring in some examples of what life was like for slaves on the other side of the world, or in other parts of the world. Now again, I'm giving you guys a brief overview, and I'm, in, I'm telling you that this is going to be a brief overview. We could spend an entire semester talking about this. I'm just giving you guys these notes as a brief um, reflection on what we discussed in class. That way you guys can study. Again, for anyone else that's not in my class listening to this, this is a brief discussion of a significantly more complicated topic, and I want to make sure I do it justice, but this is not really the best venue for me to do so. Let's talk about the life of a slave. Well, slavery itself changes in the United States. The first slaves from the 1600s and 1700s, the first groups of slaves that are brought to the United States are brought here from Africa and are from different tribes. What happens as slavery progresses though, and it's decided that the children of slaves are also permanent slaves, well, when that happens, slaves are gonna be kept in a unit and they're going to um, have children within this unit and families are gonna stay together, which also means that over the course of a couple of generations, slaves are gonna be completely going from being from different tribes, speaking different languages, to all speaking English and having a common language and a common culture and a much closer familial tie um, to life in the United States. That's gonna have a big effect and we'll talk about that in more detail later. Let's talk about health. Um, the American slave is actually considerably healthier than slaves in other parts of the world, specifically the Car uh, Caribbean. Slaves in the Caribbean die at a significantly earlier age because they are worked significantly harder and live in much more dangerous conditions than slaves in the American South. I'm not trying to say that slavery in the American South is ideal for a slave, but technically they live longer. Um, again, it sounds horrible saying stuff like that, but those are the numbers for you. Now, slaves could have one of two, uh, there's one or two types of ways that slave labor was organized. The first was going to be something called the task system, where slaves were given a set number of tasks to complete in a day. Um, if there were rebellions or insurrections on a plantation, they probably switched to something called gang labor, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Slaves are going to be chained together, and they're going to be under the direct supervision of a master with a whip, possibly a gun, and they're going to be forced to complete a set series of tasks. Um, and uh, work on them all day, every day. This is going to be the idea of the, when you hear, see the stories of the bad way that slaves are living, this is pretty much that type of system, the gang labor system. Slave resistance is actually remarkably limited in the American South. Now, a reason for this is that now that slavery has changed and the fact that children are also ones that have to deal with slavery and that there are families involved, many slaves do not want to leave the plantation for fear of what might happen to their family, or one, they might never see them again, or two, worst case scenario, that the family would be tortured and punished if one person left. So slaves are going to be reluctant to leave. However, there is going to be ways for slaves to escape but they're not easy. The most popular and most known, of course, is going to be the Underground Railroad, ran by Harriet Tubman, which is going to be a series of safe houses that slaves could visit, which would take them from the American South up through the American North, um, and eventually ending all the way up in Canada, where slavery had been completely outlawed by Great Britain. 
that of course is the goal um, the Underground Railroad obviously is significant but it doesn't save as many as well anybody would like obviously it doesn't actually save as many as anyone would like because it's actually a very difficult process imagine not knowing where you are but having to make it almost 2,000 miles north um, and only being able to travel at night if a white person sees you you're pretty much gonna get caught and sent back it's a very very difficult process